This material is a part of the Oklahoma Historical Society's Oral History Program Living Legends Collection. The original date for this material is September the 13th, 1970. This material is a WKY radio broadcast uh, called Speaking of Everything, emceed by Mr. Ed Hardy. The guest speaker on this program is Mr. Wilburn Cartwright of Oklahoma City. This material is being re-recorded on October the 24th, 1985 for inclusion in the permanent collections of the Oral History Program by Judith Michener. Thank you, Bob, and good evening, everyone. Our guest tonight is a gentleman I've been looking forward to having back for some time now. It is seldom that we repeat guests on this program as closely as we have repeated this gentleman tonight. He is Wilburn Cartwright. Mr. Cartwright was here with us, oh, less than four weeks ago as one of the Democratic candidates for governors in the Oklahoma primary, for governor in the Oklahoma primary. He was, as you know, defeated. He did draw 50,000 votes across the state, however, in the four-man primary. At the time Mr. Cartwright was here three or four weeks ago, I asked him to come back uh, when it was all over because we wanted to sit down and chat, I told him, about politics and particularly about historic people that he has known and worked with. He served in the Congress of the United States from Oklahoma from 1926 until 1943, and in the late 30s was chairman of Oklahoma's House delegation, which at that point in time was comprised of nine members. Now we have five, and it's about to become four, apparently, according to the new census. But then, in the late 30s, when Mr. Cartwright was chairman of Oklahoma's delegation to the House of Representatives, there were nine members. I've been looking forward to this because it's always fun for me, and I hope for you, interesting and fun, to talk about famous people, people who have had an impact on history or who are a part of our way of life today by virtue of things they have done and decisions they made. In many cases uh, tonight, people who lived 20, 30, 40 years ago will be folks we're talking about. So, Mr. Cartwright, uh, welcome back. Nice to have you again here on Speaking of Everything. Thank you, Ed. Thank I've, you. I've been looking forward to it. Let me just say... Uh, as uh, Governor, former Governor Edmondson and I said on election night, uh, after your concession statement, that uh, you were a gentleman and a scholar and certainly one of the gentlemen of Oklahoma politics. Uh, Governor Edmondson said at the time that uh, one thing can always be said of Wilburn Cartwright. He said in 50 years of public service, nobody ever has accused him, either publicly or behind his back, of being a dishonest man. And certainly uh, that... Uh, is a, is a title that I'm sure you bear very proudly after 50 years in public service. Thank you kindly. We're going to talk tonight about some folks you've known, and I'm, I'd am i like to start with, let's see, Calvin Coolidge, I guess, was the first president that you worked with as a congressman. Yes. Uh, I, I didn't get very well acquainted with him. It didn't seem that very many people did. He was called uh, Silent Cal, and Silent Cal he was. I did meet him. I shook hands with him uh, several times. He was a, a, a small man with, with red hair. We've had four presidents, I believe, that were, had red hair, Andrew Jackson, Martin Van Buren, and, uh, and uh, Calvin Coolidge. That would be three. That's uh, about all I could say. I'd uh, just see him. He was... Um, he would, they told a lot of stories about him that wouldn't uh, wouldn't help the situation by wouldn't help out much now. But uh, a lot of people remember the stories of how close he was financially and otherwise. And so, indeed, uh, as far as you know of Calvin Coolidge, the term "silent Cal" did fit him. It did. You met some awfully interesting people in your tenure, 17 years in the Congress representing Oklahoma. And those are some of the folks we'd like to talk about tonight, including presidents. Let's quickly run through the presidents, then we'll come back to them uh, in detail later on. Herbert Hoover. Well, um, I was there, as I say, two years of Coolidge and four years of Hoover. 
uh, Hoover's years fell upon, you might say, evil years. He was a great and good man, a patriotic American citizen. But, of course, he had to bear the brunt, the depression, and all like that. And uh, uh, when I went over to meet him, there were six others with me. We went through the line and... Uh, it was a White House reception. Yeah, through a little White House reception. And uh, when he got... He, he said, I wish you would sit down over here a little while. I want to talk to you as soon as I get through with this, uh, this group. This is President Hoover that talking to you. That was President Hoover talking to me. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I was a new member of Congress. Hadn't been there but uh, two years. And I, I didn't know hardly what to think, but I sat down. And after he got through, why, uh, he came over and sat down with me. And he said, uh, and you're from Oklahoma? I said, yes, sir. Well, what uh, part of Oklahoma? I said, well, I'm from the southeast corner, but I've recently, I recently had a job looking up disabled veterans, and uh, I've been up around Ponca City and so on. He says, that's what I wanted to know about, Ponca City. I was partly reared there. You didn't know that, did you? I said, no, sir, I did not. Well, he said, uh, I was an orphan boy, and I was passed around from uncle and aunt and so forth, and... I was sent to an uncle in Oklahoma, and I spent I, my, um, from 14 to 16, I was in high school in Ponca City. I fished out on Bird Creek. I said, well, I was up there the other day and saw a bunch of people fishing there. This and is President Hoover. That was President Hoover telling me about it. Now, he said, I'd like for you to tell me about those Indians killing each other, those uh, Osages to get the head rights. They, if a relative would die or be killed or something, why, uh, they would inherit the head rights. And so it so happened that I knew quite a bit about it because I'd been up there looking up these disabled veterans, and I told them all about it as far as I knew. And uh, he said, well, that's very interesting, and I'm glad to get a report from where I used to live and go to school. And ever after that, when I'd see President Hoover, he would specially mention it. Mm -hmm. Franklin D. Roosevelt. Well, Franklin D. Roosevelt was the most personable man I ever saw in my life. He had more personal magnetism. And he was, the, he was and showed that he was my personal friend on various occasions. But, of course, soon after he came in as president, I became chairman of one of the most important committees. Naturally, we had a lot in common, that of roads and highways of this nation. And he'd call me over there on different occasions to talk to me or talk to me over the telephone. He'd even do that sometime. And so uh, quite a friendship grew up between us. The White House in your days in Washington was not quite as it is today. This was before the days of the West Wing, wasn't it? Uh, I yes. Don't, the, it was just the White House, the mansion itself, sat alone, and the president kept his office there, I believe downstairs in what is now the formal area That's of the White right. House, That's and right. lived upstairs. But he didn't have that West Wing, that long uh, spit of uh, construction that goes out toward the executive office building. That's right. And that day and age, the old the EOB now, which is known as the executive office building, was the uh, War Department, wasn't it, or the State Department, uh, or Secretary of War and Navy and yeah. Navy. A war. Did and you Navy. did you get the feeling that I still get today when I walk into the White House and I spent a lot of time around it as a correspondent, and you have as a congressman. Uh, do you still get the feeling, would you still get it today, do you think, uh, that, that great awesome feeling that always seems to come over you when you step into the world? Yes, house? when I think of the history, and having taught history, both in my high school, wherever I was principal or superintendent, and uh, I also during the summer at Durant Teachers College, I, I taught history. And having all that history behind me of the presidents, the various presidents from Washington on down, uh, it always uh, gave me a great patriotic feeling. 
Mr. Cartwright, you are a Democrat, uh, so I think I can assume your answer, but whom would you rate amongst these three presidents uh, under whom you served in the Congress as the best? I would take President Franklin D. Roosevelt, but I like the other two uh, very much. They were very, very good men. Uh, you, Calvin Coolidge's record is an inspiration to any man or young man to start in, as he did, from a little far from a farm boy and reach the presidency and never lose a step all the way. Mm -hmm. You met some awfully interesting people on the floors of that Congress when you served there for 17 years from 1926 until 1943. One of them, you were telling me, was Winston Churchill of England. Yes, when I first went to uh, Congress, I was uh, trying to get acquainted with the different members. And ex-members have the right to come and sit on the floor whenever they feel like it. Ex-members of the House. Yes, ex-members. In other words, if you were in Washington uh, tomorrow, yes, sir, I could uh, had go a mind to, you could go on the floor. Yes. So um, uh, I saw a very nice-looking fella sitting out on the floor there. Kind what of year on. is this? Well, that is 19 and, and uh, 27, I believe. Mm -hmm. Must have been 27. And uh, so I got over by him, and I said, are you a farmer member? He said, no, sir, I'm a, I'm a member of the British Parliament. Well, I said, I'm very glad to meet you. Uh, my name is Cartwright. He says, my name is Churchill, Winston <laughs> Churchill. And uh, This, of course, is long before he gained his World oh, War II yes, fame. Oh, yes, that's why I didn't know him. Yeah. When it was all over, I didn't know him. I hadn't, uh, I hadn't realized other than I'd spoken to a member of British Parliament. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm half American. My mother was born, reared over here at Baltimore. I said, well, that's very interesting. I'd never heard that before either, but I found out later all that was true. And I said, well, what brings you to our... Uh, well, he said, I have the right of the floor. The, uh, the Congress does give me the right uh, to come on the floor. But your speaker, Mr. Longworth, Teddy Roosevelt's son-in-law, was over in London uh, last summer, and uh, I visited with him. I showed him through Parliament, and uh, he said, well, when you come to America, come down and have lunch with me and, uh, and in Washington. Well, he said, I have a daughter in a show in New York, and I'm over here visiting her, so I came down here to have lunch with uh, your speaker, Mr. Longworth. And uh, so uh, that afternoon, uh, Mr. Longworth came in the uh, Democratic cloakroom, and uh, I said, say, Mr. Speaker, uh, I saw a member of the British Parliament on the floor this afternoon, or this morning. He said, yes, yes, and he said he was going to have uh, lunch with you. Yes, yes, he had lunch with me. Well, I said, how do you like him? He says, I don't like him. If he was around here very long, he'd be running this place. <laughs> so <laughs> Churchill was a man that uh, you either liked him or you didn't like him, and he was a strong character. One of Oklahoma, not one of, Oklahoma's perhaps greatest citizen of the world, not even perhaps, Oklahoma's greatest citizen of the world, Will Rogers. Well, I also had occasion to meet uh, Will Rogers for the first time. Though he was from Oklahoma, I'd never met him. I just knew about him. This is after you've gotten to the Congress. This is you after hadn't... I'd gotten to the Congress. Well... One day, I was uh, sitting, and that was during the Calvin Coolidge administration, all right, I remember that. Uh, I was at my, de at my desk in the congressional office, and uh, I was conscious that someone had stepped up to my desk, and I looked up, and it was Will Rogers. I knew him from pictures. I said, well, Mr. Rogers, and uh, he said... Uh, 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 my name is Will Rogers. I said, well, well, thank you for the correction. And uh, uh, 
What, uh, is there anything I could do for you? I wanted to see the color of the hair of the man that could beat one of my fellow Indians. I said, you know, <laughs> we Indians have got to stick together. There's not very many of us. I said, well, I didn't know that you were so concerned about him. Oh, yes. This said, is the fellow whom you had beaten for this That's the man Congress. I had beaten, Charlie Carter. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he... Uh, I said, well, uh, let's have lunch together. It's now lunchtime, and I have to get ready to go on the floor. And he said, all right, don't care if I do. So we started walking over there and just casual talking, and uh, we ordered our lunch. And I said, now, Will, uh, tell me, how long does it take you to write those... Uh, telegrams that you send out every day. Well, there's nothing worthwhile but hard work. And he says, that's what I was raised on. I make a lot of fun, but that's a part of my business. I work hard at it. It takes about four hours to write one of those. I go down in the afternoon to the newsstand. I take the latest paper, the latest magazines. I go to my room. You're talking about his column. Yes, that column. Uh, and and uh, I lay them out before me. I thumb through, read what attracts my attention, work them off on the other end. Don't have time. Pick them up. The other end of the table. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I get through what sticks in my mind, I write it down. So it is the latest. That's why it stands up. It's the latest comment. Was he as humorous and uh, as gregarious and outgoing a person when you talk with him privately and... Uh spent some time with him privately, as he appeared to be in public? Yes, he was. He was just naturally funny. Anything he said seemed to be funny, humorous. Did you have occasion after that, after having met him, to get together with him again on particular occasions, or did you become Yes, I, saw, I, I went to, like uh, when, they, when they opened his hotel, the, uh, the Will Rogers Hotel in Claremore, mm -hmm. I was a spe invited as a special guest, and and was there and talked with him and sit with his sister, Sally, Sally McFadden. That's the hotel now that has all of the uh, all of his gun collection. Over there no, I don't think that. No, that's another museum near there. But For some that, reason or other, I thought yeah, that well, gun collection that was in that hotel. That gun collection was in a ho hotel, but it wasn't the Will Rogers Hotel. It's another one there close by. If we have time, I'd like to come back to Will Rogers. Charles Lindbergh. Well, uh, I, I was in Congress when Lindbergh made the first flight across the Atlantic. And uh, he came back and uh, n uh, sent a letter to the congressman, more or less a foreign letter. Well, I answered it, a inviting us, any members of Congress, that he was getting another plane, that he could take up as many as eight and would take them for a ride around around uh, the uh, around the capital uh, uh, and the environments there. And uh, this is 1928 or 29. Yes, that's right. But I uh, must have been about 28. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I uh, I looked around and I found Jed Johnson. He said yes, he'd go. And Congressman Cole of uh, of Maryland said he would go. A congressman from down in South Carolina said he would go. A congressman swing from out in California said he'd go. And another congressman from Massachusetts. And we ought to so, explain at this point in time, flying was not an everyday occurrence like it oh, is now. Oh, no. No, the congressman, they, they shied away from it. And, uh, <laughs> I did well to get up a little crowd for him. <laughs> so I went up, and while, and while I was up, naturally, I, having promoted the little to her, why, uh, he talked to me, and he said, say, being a congressman is a pretty good job. He says, uh, I was almost one. My dad was one for 10 years, and I handed out cards and campaign for him and so on, and so it's a pretty good job. I said, well, I didn't know that uh, your dad was a member of Congress. Yes, yes, he and La Follette were close personal friends, and La Follette wanted him to run for the United States Senate, and uh, so... Uh, we started running for the United States Senate, 
and uh, no, not United States Senate. I mean, uh, uh, governor, governor of oh, Wisconsin, Wisconsin, governor yes. of Wisconsin, and uh, you know, uh, uh, the war was on, and and my dad and La Follette had been against the war, and so uh, <clears throat> they uh, uh, passed our city ordinance and wouldn't let my dad speak in cities. So uh, <laughs> I uh, he had. Uh, uh, had to advertise it, and I'd hand out bills advertising his speaking outside the city limits. How do you feel? You know, Charles Lindbergh has, in the past few weeks, released his new book. He's written a new book. I saw something about yeah, it. Which he uh, says again, in which he says again, that uh, he feels the United States was wrong in entering World War II, and that although we defeated Hitler, that uh, we, in effect, found ourselves siding with people like Russia and uh, communist China and that uh, we may have indeed lost although we won. This type of talk and this type of feeling many people in this country I suspect have now forgotten was very prevalent in the early 40s yes. when the Congress was called upon to vote that war. That's right. As a matter of fact, I believe you attribute part of your defeat finally in 1943 right. to your I vote for the war. Voted you voted to declare war, and you attribute yeah. part of your reason for your defeat by what, 700 votes or something? About 700 votes. To that. Uh, did Lindbergh express this feeling to this day? Uh, do you find anybody else that does? Or can you understand well, his feeling? I know uh, you don't agree I, with him, I guess. I may not exactly agree with him. Uh, but uh, uh, there's been a lot of change of sentiment, and the recent, more recent wars in the Far East, you know, have, have changed a lot of people's sentiment, and mm -hmm. what they used to be, they now are not, on their on, on their thinking about wars. Was your flight with Charles Lindbergh your first airplane ride? That was my first airplane ride well, with if you're Charles go, Lindbergh. You might as well go first class if you're yes, going to go. Sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Another fella, Oklahoman. I believe uh, you folks in those days referred to him as the crazy congressman from Oklahoma, Manuel Herrick. Oh, my goodness. He, mm. was, he was some character. Now, he had uh, served his two years. He was an accident, of course, because the 8th District are a very intelligent, high-class people. But because of the fluke in the law... Where, where, where basically was he from? You say well, the 8th District. Uh, where the was the 8th District over to Enid and all in through there. It was, then, it was the 8th the District. Mm -hmm. And what eighth. kind of a fluke elected him? Well, 40 days before the election, uh, no one else could file, and no one had the nerve to file against Dick Morgan, who was the well-known, well-liked, capable congressman, though a Republican, from... Uh, from uh, from that district, so he had filed. So this uh, Manuel Herrick had filed, and he had been in the insane asylum. And yes, he, sir. Yeah, I'd he was a, had been a judge mentally incompetent on a. Yeah, yes. And he filed, and then what happened? Well, when when he filed, they the a bunch of the Republicans uh, came down to Oklahoma City and tried to get him off. I said, no, <laughs> he's on there and uh, he's nominated, and Dick T. Morgan fell dead, you see, with a heart That's attack. Right. That's what he happened died. to him, you see. And there was no uh, opponent, no, so Herrick uh, was elected. Yeah, so Herrick was elected. Uh, it's a long story. A book could be written about a lot of that. Anyway, that had just happened before I got up there. And one day... I, I looked up and I saw a fella coming over towards me on the floor. He 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 looks like some uh, uh, laboring man or, or somebody that hadn't had time to clean up, because he <laughs> he he, he, look, he was uh, he was sweaty, and uh, he had on uh, old shoes and they looked like brogan shoes with brass eyes. And crapgrass seed was uh, sticking out of those. <laughs> and uh, he came over pretty close to me, and I got over by him. I was anxious to find out what manner of man this was. And, and I introduced myself, and he said he, he was Manuel Herrick from Oklahoma. Uh, and he had a, 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 a voice like a woman, a kind of a shrill voice. And uh, so I uh, saw his coattail was pushed up quite a bit, like he had a newspaper under there. 
I didn't uh -huh. think about it at the time, being a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> but <laughs> I, uh, I, I had a little conversation there with him. Then he said, I'm going out and meet some old friends back here in the cloakroom. Well, I waited a few moments, and then I went back there, and they were having a time. He had pulled this thing out of his hip pocket and his bottle of whiskey, and he was <laughs> telling him he made it. And that he uh, and he was passing it around among the congressmen, and they, most all of them, took a little sip of it. And of course, they told him it was good. And he said, "I made it. I made it myself. I made it myself." Well, um, <laughs> sometime after that, uh, I saw where they'd caught him making whiskey over in Maryland. I saw it in the paper. <laughs> A congressman, well, a yes, crazy. sir. Yeah, crazy congressman. Well, he got out of that saying that he was doing that just to get on the inside and find out what was going on <laughs> so he could turn it into the <laughs> revenue people. Well, he got out of it uh, under that kind of a fluke. Oh, my God. The next thing I heard of Manuel Herrick, he had uh, uh, the uh, this uh, uh, uranium thing became famous, yes, you know, right, and uh, I heard of him out in California with a little old donkey, a, a shovel and a pick and a few things like that, you know, going up in the mountains, and the citizens around there said, you better not go up there because you'll freeze to death. The winter's coming on now, but he kept going. So in the spring, they found Manuel Herrick's uh, uh, body and his donkey and his picks and his shovels and and his little cooking utensils up in the mountains, frozen to death, all of them in a pile. That's the story of Manuel Herrick. That's the ma end of Manuel The crazy Herrick. congressman from Oklahoma. That's right. You're listening to Speaking of Everything. Our guest tonight is Wilburn Cartwright, a congressman from Oklahoma for 17 years who served under three presidents. And we're just talking old-time folks and names and history tonight and hoping you're enjoying it. We're going to move on to FDR and President Hoover and some other interesting stories in just a moment. But first, I must say that my name is Ed Hardy. Uh, speaking of everything is the name of the program, and we come to you from WKY Radio in Oklahoma City. Let's talk now, Mr. Cartwright, about the time somebody came into your office and told you he was thinking about killing the President of the United States. Well, um... Uh, a, a man by the name of Smith uh, from my district and even from my hometown <laughs> came in one day when Hoover was so unpopular. President Hoover, of course, because of the situation, became probably the most un, unpopular president. They blamed him for everything. For the Depression and the whole yeah, thing, yeah. yes. And... Uh, I asked this fella how he was getting along and so on. Oh, he said, under this Hoover administration, he says, I wish I had a chance, I would kill him. I'd, if I had a chance, I'd shoot him. And I, I stood up, I said, wait a minute. I said, why, well, that would be the worst thing in this world you could do. And I want you to understand that I, if I was a bodyguard for President Hoover, I would defend him with my life. Doesn't matter about whether he's Democrat or Republican. He's a great American. He's a patriotic American citizen. And you, you, you ought to be ashamed of yourself to talk like that. And I just bawled him out good. Well, the next morning, the first man in my office was that man. He said, Congressman, I didn't sleep last night after you bawled me out like you did. You was right. I was wrong. I thought it would please you because so many people were criticizing the president. I said, that's what he asked for, that job, what brings on a lot of criticism. But he's a great American, and don't, don't never forget the idea that anybody that gets to be president of the United States is, is a great man. I don't care who he is. That's probably a thought that a lot of us would do well to keep in mind today uh, in the 1970s, regardless of the fact that we've advanced technologically and we're so modern and we've got so more, many more people and so many more ideas about how to do things and all. That job is a backbreaker, and That's the right. man who is president of the United States, regardless of politics, 
uh, deserves and should command the respect and the love uh, of Americans. They can disagree with him That's right. and his policies, but it certainly deserves it. I know he said, well, I've heard you criticize him. Well, I said, of course you have. You might hear me criticize most anybody, but uh, that, that doesn't mean any, any violence. Let's get to, uh, to what early historians, uh, by early historians I mean historians alive and writing now, uh, seem to indicate uh, may be the giant of American presidents for the 20th century, uh, President Franklin and Delano Roosevelt. He was a friend of yours. You did know him and work yes, with him. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, how did you come initially to meet President Roosevelt the first time? Well, of course, we have uh, one uh, uh, party every year reception at the White House. That was really the first time I met him. Then I was specially invited since I had become uh, chairman of the Committee on Roads and Highways. And uh, naturally, he was interested in highways and the big international highways. And uh, I had introduced uh, the uh, bill for the setting up of our present federal highway system, under which all roads in the United States and their outlying possessions must conform to the specifications of the Hayden Cartwright Act. That had uh, every word of it had been written in my committee and a large part of it by my own hands. And is responsible primarily today, uh, nearly 40 years later, for the interstate highways, which That's we all right. drive on and enjoy. That is. The, the, right. Of course, they, they've amended the law and all, but it's still the Hayden Cartwright Act. Yes. So the president, uh, President Roosevelt, uh, invited you back to the ho White House on several occasions for business meetings and so on as a result of your position as chairman of Rhodes. That's Highway. right. Then one day, I, I'll never forget, uh, President Roosevelt uh, um, uh, had the, his secretary, uh, Colonel McIntyre, call me. And we just uh, completed on the floor, and then after we get through on the floor, we go to our, we would go to our offices, Congress. That's the usual procedure for a congressman. We'd go over and sign up his mail, and then go home. Well, the telephone rang. My secretary was already gone, and uh, he uh, says, "This is Colonel McIntyre." Oh, I said, "Oh yes, Colonel. I know you. I remember you very well." Well, he said, "The boss asked me." to invite you and two senators and another congressman. And that, uh, they, I said, well, 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 who are they? Not that it makes much difference. Well, he said, uh, Senator Hayden of Arizona, Zona, Senator uh, uh, McKellar of Tennessee, uh, uh, Congressman Taylor of Colorado, who is chairman of the Appropriations Committee in the House, and you as chairman of the Committee on Roads and Highways. Well, I said that's uh, th that's uh, equal to a command, and so I'll be there. Well, he says, don't go home. Call your wife. Tell her and your family that you're going over to the White House. And so I did. And... Uh, uh, we uh, had our usual dinner uh, up in his room, up uh, near uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln's old desk there. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, we had a pleasant meeting. He also had there uh, uh, Basil uh, O'Connor, his former law partner. He said, now Basil's here tonight, not in the same interest that you gentlemen are, but uh, uh, I'm uh, letting him sleep in Abraham Lincoln's bed. He said, now Basil chair tonight, not in the same interest that you gentlemen are, but uh, uh, I'm uh, letting him sleep in Abraham Lincoln's bed in that little room in there because I have that right and I'm going to let Basil sleep in that room where President Lincoln slept during all the time he was president of the United States. And uh, so uh, 
Uh, he said, now, my wife, this was just a visiting party, like, said, my wife, Mrs. Roosevelt, is down somewhere in Texas, and she writes me this letter. He read, we need more water down here. We, we, they, they need more water. And that was the starting of the Hoover, uh, what they call, I believe, the Hoover Dam, some big dam down there. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he, he, uh, he got around to um, saying, you know, it is awful dry down there. And I said, yes, sir, Mr. President, I hear that the, that the dogs run after the trees down there. And <laughs> he rired back with that. I can see him yet as he rired back with that long stem cigarette and laughed yeah. about it. A and great Roosevelt grin and laugh. He yes, had. yes. And, uh, well, during our conversation, he, uh, he said, now, gentlemen, we, 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 you know what we, uh, we're all interested in. And it's my job to kind of reveal to you fellows, you're kind of the main folks that are chairman of important committees. And so uh, uh, first thing I'd like to ta ta talk just a little bit about, see what you gentlemen think about it. Uh, you know, Abraham Lincoln has this wonderful monument over here, uh, memorial to him. So, now, that's wonderful. I'm all for that. But did you ever realize that Thomas Jefferson, the greatest Democrat that ever lived, says, I don't know whether it is Abraham Lincoln, the greatest Democrat, or, 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 or Thomas Jefferson, has been a question in my mind, which one was the greatest real Democrat? What I mean is people that have their democratic ways. Yeah. And he said, uh, I would like for you fellas to start something over there to get some kind of a memorial to Thomas Jefferson. Well, I said, Mr. President, I hadn't thought of that, but uh, that's, uh, that's a wonderful thing. Now, these older persons, they were way up towards the, in their 80s then. These uh, other, other members, I was the young one and more outspoken. I said, well, I'll do what I can. I'll even introduce a bill to that effect, or I'll cooperate with someone else. He said, all right, I just wanted to get your sentiment. The others were slow, but finally they, uh, the others spoke up and said, yes, Mr. President, I'll be glad to help. I'll be glad to help on it. Well, that was the starting of the Jefferson Memorial. Of the Jefferson Memorial. Which is a gorgeous building. Yes, sir. Well, gorgeous the, building. the, um, uh, they uh, had to have someone to uh, introduce the bill. Well, I found that the proper one would be Congressman Patrick from New York. He was on the committee that would uh, naturally have been the one to do that. So he introduced the bill, and we supported it, and that's the uh, Jefferson, Jefferson Memorial. Memorial on the... Uh, right uh, there in the river. Yeah. Right on the riverfront down there. That's right. It's a beautiful building. I recall President Kennedy uh, said one evening... Uh, when I was a correspondent at the White House, he had a dinner in which the Nobel Peace Prize winners, over several years, Americans who had won the Nobel Prize, uh, had been invited uh, to dinner along with several intellectual guests. And it was a reasonably small but select gathering. And the president raised his glass after dinner when they had allowed the correspondents to come in and view the dinner, raised his glass in a toast and indicated in the toast that he felt that this gathering, this particular eating, was perhaps the most august, intellectual, most knowledgeable group of men ever to dine at the White House, with the possible exception of when Thomas Jefferson dined alone. And oh, uh, that something? And uh, that, of course, uh, really. He was the most versatile president we ever had. He was, uh, if he would have been, if he had been in music, he would have ranked as one of the greatest one of the great violinists. I understand. And was one yeah. of the architects. He would have uh, been one of the greatest architects this country has ever had. I think, uh, you know, who knows, but I, I would imagine if he were alive today, he would appreciate the architectural beauty of that memorial, which yes, the sir. bill you fellows discussed that night at the White oh, House yes. brought, brought about. You've well, been on a few can't. Well, go ahead. Well, um, at that meeting, after we had broken up, we discussed a number of things, and uh, we'd broken up, and we were leaving, and he had ordered a taxi cab for us, had uh, had one of his servants there order a taxi cab for us. 
But uh, as I was going out, he caught me by the shoulder and said, wait a minute. As you've expressed That's the president, president, yeah, Roosevelt. president Roosevelt said, wait a minute, you've expressed an interest in history, and I, I want you to I want you to wait a while after the others are gone. Well, he kept me there till after 12 o'clock talking about Abraham Lincoln. I, uh, of course, uh, he'd pump me, and I'd tell him what some of the things I'd known as a <laughs> teacher of history, and, mm -hmm. uh, and I'd been in Illinois and had visited the Lincoln places there and so mm -hmm. on. And uh, he said, now, come in this room. And he went in a wheelchair. They didn't picture him that way. Yeah. But he said, come in here. So we went in that little room. He said, see those boots under there? I said, yes, sir. Well, I said, pick them up. Take a good look at them. Well, I did. They were soft-topped, black boots, shined. They, they looked all right. Well, he said that was his extra pair of boots. He was killed with his boots on over yonder at Ford Theater. That isn't very far over yes. Ford Theater. And he's killed with his other pair on over there. So he was killed with his boots on. And uh, so I took a good look at those. And uh, he said, you know, his, there's a lot that the people don't know, and probably it's not of too much interest, but did you know that uh, his wife spent two years in an insane asylum? I said, no, sir, I didn't know it. Well, he said... Uh, Mary they were, Todd Lincoln. Mary Todd Lincoln said they were going to send her, and papers had been filled out to send her to the insane asylum when their boy Ted died in the White House. They lost a mm -hmm. son like yes. the Coolidge's. Yes. And uh, she just moaned and made so much noise, screaming and going on all the time. And uh, he said, uh, step over there by that window. And I stepped over that as the president telling me what to do. <laughs> That's right. And I I looked out and I said, Look across yonder, do you see um, do you see Santa Elizabeth? I said, No, sir, not on on account of those trees. I know where it is. Well, those trees didn't used to be there. They weren't there then. Well, she was standing there by that window. And Lincoln was over here at this desk. This is his desk he, that he, uh, that he uh, wrote all of his great things about, emancipation and such as that. And he said, uh, Mary, look over at that, uh, at the insane asylum, Santa Elizabeth. The papers are filled out to send you over there. You are not crazy. All you have to do is catch yourself now. I ha yeah, I could I love my boy just as much as you do, but uh, the uh, the war the responsibility the Civil War is on my shoulders, and I can't give away to it like you have. Now catch yourself. So she admitted afterwards that that's what kept her out then, but later on back in Illinois, her own son circulated. A petition, got her in the insane asylum, and she was kept there for two years. I'd never heard that story about Mary Todd Lincoln. And he said when she got out, when they let her out, she was so mad at her at her uh, son and her, her relatives that she, uh, she was a cultured lady. People didn't know that she was, but she spoke fluent English, a fluent French, and she went to France and changed her name and lived in a small village under an assumed name and uh, lived there. And one day she was putting up Lincoln's picture at the foot of her bed so she could lay and look at him as the picture would hang on the wall. And she fell and over a, a, a bedpost caught her under her ribs and, it, and she thought she was going to die. She told them who she was. They got in touch with her son and relatives in the United States, and they got her back to the United States. And uh, that is a story that a lot of people do not, does not know. I have know. never heard that about Mary Todd Lincoln. And President Roosevelt is the one who told you about He's it. He's the one that told me every word of it that way. You uh, made a few campaign tours with President Roosevelt, didn't you? Yes, I was around when... When he was campaigning and I was on the train that came through Oklahoma, 
I introduced him at Worcester, Oklahoma. We came in from Arkansas and uh, through Arkansas, and uh, I introduced him at Worcester when the train stopped there. And uh, that's a very easy thing to introduce president. All you can say yes. is, mis uh, is mis uh, ladies and gentlemen, the president of the United States. But as soon as we, uh, but before I introduced him, he, uh, he wanted to talk to me a little, let this train stand a few minutes. He says, I've got to find out something about politics. Well, I said, uh, the last few days I've been more concerned about you and, and, and your campaign, but I think I can tell you what maybe you want to know about Oklahoma politics. Well, he says, you're the leader of the delegation, and I want you to tell me what about it. And he said, who is... Um, West Disney for that is a congressman from up in uh, the north uh, northeast corner of the state. Mm -hmm. I said, well, he's for Gomer Smith. Well, he said that blankety blank. <laughs> After I had appointed his imbecile brother, of course, he's not imbecile, but he, that yeah, was when right. he was angry. After I appointed him to that important position in Washington, then him treat me like that. I don't want Gomer Smith. Well, of course, I, I liked uh, West Disney, but, uh, and I liked Gomer Smith. I was on friendly terms with him, but that was the way he took it. And so he said, Mac, hand me that speech. So Mac runs around in another compartment and brings out this old speech, and the president lays it right down before him and with a big old blue pencil. He went through the part where it said, all, um, all um, credit due to the construction of the uh, of the uh, uh, dam up up around Disney. There, what's the name of that dam? Whatever uh, that is. Oh, I know what you mean. I can't think of it either. Offhand. Well, Grand River Dam. Yes. Grand yes. River Dam is due to Elmer E. Thomas of Oklahoma. Well, Disney was expecting to get credit for it, and uh, I was, um, and uh, I saw Disney uh, uh, when we got to Oklahoma City. When when Disney was on the platform, and he was just right in front of me, and it looked like the back of his head kind of turned white from <laughs> from what the president from said. what the president said, and it really, I think, broke the back. Uh, of that campaign because Gomer Smith, in my opinion, would have beaten uh, Elmer Thomas if it hadn't have been for the president taking sides that way. Mm -hmm. Well, the president's got an awful lot of powerful political oh, yeah. clout when he wants to use it, yes, no matter he who has. he is. You told me also uh, at one point in time in the last few weeks about at least two funeral trains that you spent some time on. Uh, yes, I uh, the house. I was uh, I was pretty active in the in the organization, and it so happened I was lucky in uh, supporting the candidate. We have uh, big fights uh, on uh, uh, like to do in the legislature on who is going to be speaker. Mm -hmm. Well, the uh, the first speaker that I supported was John Garner. Uh, after the death of Nick Longworth and the turnover of, from the Republicans to the uh, Democrats, but that wasn't much of a much of a contest. Uh, uh, that that one wasn't. So uh, I, uh, but uh, but uh, John Garner then became my personal friend, and he put a lot of extra work on. In fact, he made me assistant whip and 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 so on. And uh, uh, I had a lot of experience that way. Well, the uh, next uh, national convention, they nominated uh, President uh, uh, nominated John Garner for president, and that took him out uh, out of the out of the Congress. You made him vice president. You made him vice president, and uh, he was succeeded by Henry T. Rainey. I I supported him, and he was elected. Then Henry T. Rainey was making a speech one day, and he fell over dead. The speaker, it's a killing job. And so uh, Mr. Rainey died, and, and, uh, and uh, Joe Burns succeeded him.
Well, Joe Burns didn't last very long. The day that Joe Burns died, he called me to the platform, just motioned to me from down on the floor. I went up there, and he said, Wilburn, take over. I, I, and don't let in it, don't let on. But there's something terribly wrong with me. Oh, I said, maybe you're, you'll be all right. He said, no. Well, I said, you want me to help you off the platform? No, no. Let me get down the best I can. I'm going home, and I'm going to call my pastor. I don't know why he would be telling me all this, but I had supported him for speaker, and and uh, he was a personal friend of mine, and he said, I'm going home and call my pastor. I'm going to give him the chapter and the verse because I'm going to die. Oh, I said, surely you're mistaken. No. Says, I feel it coming on. And he left. Sorry. And the next morning, the first thing I saw in the Washington Post, the streaming headlines were, Speaker Burns of Tennessee died last night in his sleep. And I was chosen to go on that funeral train mm -hmm. by the president and, and, his, and uh, a few of those around him. They knew my connection. Mr. Cartwright. Same way with the Speaker Bankhead, and, mm -hmm. and I, I went. I was on the funeral train down to uh, Jasper, Alabama, for his funeral. You're chairman of the Security uh, Corporation Commission now. Uh, no, well, I'm vice chairman. Uh, vice chairman, rather, of the Corporation Commission. Seventeen years in the Congress through uh, some of the most historic years of uh, the 20th century. Do you miss it? You talk, you know, you know when you sit here and talk for the last few minutes, like you talk like you're still there. You say we, and uh, yeah. do you miss it? Yes, I miss it very much. That had been my life's ambition, to be a member of Congress. Mm -hmm. And when I lost, there was a large part of me lost. Then I, I won't, I'd always wanted to be an officer in the Army, so I had my opportunity, and uh, I became a major and was served through North Africa, Italy, Sicily, had some narrow escapes and uh, was injured in a jeep accident at Villa Ventura near Foggia, Italy mm -hmm. in the latter part of 1944. Actually, you had wanted to resign uh, your congressional yes, seat and go to war when the war was declared and President Roosevelt prevailed upon you to stay until the end of your term. Yes, he sent some colonel over there and asked me as a personal favor to stay on until my time expired, and I did. In 50 years of public service, Mr. Cartwright, here in Oklahoma and in Washington as a congressman, but 50 years of service to Oklahomans, if you had to pick one man out of all the people you met in your public life whom you think contributed the most to America or to Oklahoma, could you do that or would you have to pick one or two or three? Well, I'd say President Franklin Delano Roosevelt without equivocation or mental reservation. There's no doubt in your mind. That's right. Of course, historians agree with you, as you know. I didn't know that. You know, they, they, the, the contemporary historians do. Uh, of course, as you well know, history is better written 100 years later when you can see the full scope of results of decisions, etc. But the contemporary historians of uh, this point in time do agree that FDR was, will undoubtedly be the greatest president of the 20th century, unless something, someone else comes along between now and the end of the century. Well, I've certainly enjoyed this conversation tonight. Uh, maybe just you and I are the only ones that did. I don't know, but it was certainly interesting well, for Well, it's me. a pleasure to tell you, because I could talk endlessly all about my, uh, my life clear on up to now, which is nothing out of the ordinary, but it's, it's my life. Well, it's been one of service to Oklahoma, Mr. Cartwright, and I, you should be, and I'm sure you are proud of your your tenure in public office and service to Oklahoma. Well, it's it's a pleasure to reach this stage in my life with no black marks against me. What about, oh, uh, boy, I shouldn't ask you this, but I'm going to ask you any, what about Oklahoma politics? Who, who do you think it, uh, has had the most impact on Oklahoma politics and Oklahoma as a person uh, since its uh, statehood? Well, I'd, uh, I'd have to say uh, Charlie Haskell and uh, Bill Murray. 
back there because they did farm this state. They were on the ground floor. They wrote the Constitution, and they that is, they presided there. They, they, they made this state to, to start with, you see. Mm -hmm. They had their faults, of course, but they were outstanding men. And, of course, our greatest export, I suppose, has been Will Rogers and a few of our yes. great cowboys. We've had some, some world champion cowboys yes, that have become known around the world. Yes, sir. Now, Will Rogers are outstanding Oklahoman, as far as that goes. And most, Wiley most Post. Love. Uh, Wiley Post was a great man. Did you know Wiley Post? Yes, I knew Wiley Post, knew his brother, his brother knew his family, knew... And uh, I'm a member of the same church over here, First Baptist Church, with Wiley Post's brother, who's one of the teachers there in our Sunday school. Now. Well, Mr. Cartwright, uh, we have just flat run out of time. Uh, as I say again, I've enjoyed it. Uh, I, for one, the more and more I've talked with you and watched you campaign around the state last month and the month before when you were running for governor, uh, I would like to have seen you become governor. I think it would have been an interesting four years. Well, uh, you uh, that's something I better not come <laughs> That's true. But uh, certainly we've enjoyed it uh, tonight, and uh, we'll look forward. Maybe we'll do this again someday in the next few months, uh, and we'll cover some different areas of history that you've been involved in. Be a pleasure. Our guest tonight has been Wilburn Cartwright, and we've talked history. Now here's Bob Coker. <laughs>